Hi, this is the last lecture for our class, and um, I'm going to try to make it fun, <laughs> more fun than they usually are. Uh, so we will today uh, do more detail on the traveling wave solutions. the ones discovered by D'Alembert, and we'll tie them in to the Fourier series methods for um, initial boundary value problems for the wave equation. And then we'll do a couple fun examples to illustrate. Uh, to illustrate the connection and tie a lot of ideas together. I don't have a warm-up exercise for you today, but I do want to start uh, with something I'd like you to keep in mind, and um, that is the building block solutions, the product solutions, separation of variables solutions. for um, the various types of initial boundary value problems that we've been talking about. So first for the wave equation, UTT, which is A squared UXX, when we looked for solutions that were functions of X times functions of T, we came up with uh, and this was in the context of boundary value problems, C1 cos uh, omega x plus C2 sine omega x for the x dependence. And um, then we had to multiply those by functions, sinusoidal functions of uh, T, and the angular frequencies here were a times the ones for the x uh, functions. And uh, the reason for that, and, and how you can always check that you're doing things right, is when you take t derivatives of these product solutions, every time you take a t derivative, you get a plus or minus a omega from these terms. And every time uh, times uh, the, the next, the other sinusoidal function, every time you take an x derivative, you just get a um, plus or minus omega. So since you're getting factors of a times more when you take the t derivatives, that's why you'll have a squared as many after you take two t derivatives. In other words, utt is a squared times uxx. And when we were doing initial boundary value problems of type 1 or type 2, on interval 0 to L, then the omega n's were n pi over L. And um, if we scale things right, we can always work on the interval from 0 to pi, and then the pi and the L cancel, and we're back to our favorite Fourier series where the omega ends are 
in. All right, and since we're reviewing, uh, we do have a final exam coming up next week. Let's uh, contrast that with uh, sort of a digression for today, but let's consider it review. Uh, for the heat equation, U sub T equals K U sub XX. We got the same uh, for the initial boundary value problems. We got the same X dependence. For the product solutions. And then uh, for the T dependence, it was a decaying exponential e to the minus k omega squared t. And you can see, you can check that that's right also, because when you take a t derivative, you'll get a, a factor multiplying your function, uh, which is minus k omega squared. And when you take two x derivatives, you get a minus omega squared. And so when you multiply it by k, you've got the same thing. And the same omega ends. Um, I should add, because sometimes people forget this, that we didn't quite get everything here because it is possible that when you separate variables, um, the, the ratios uh, uxx over u and utt, uh, uh, vtt over v are constant, and you can also get constant solutions. Um, In terms of Fourier series, it's the A naught over two term. Because for sure, constant solutions solve uh, their second C partial is their A squared times their second X partial, since both sides are zero. And it's the same for the heat equation. Okay, so that's a little review. Now let's go back to the wave equation. And let's think about the wave equation for uh, waves that are defined on the entire real line. And um, let's call u of x0 f of x and u sub t at x0 g of x. And we'll assume that f and g are twice continuously differentiable. And uh, in that case, you can just write down a solution, and in your homework, you're going to show in your very last homework problem, I think, that it's the only solution, is given by this formula. And we already talked about the first part in the last lecture, the one-half f of x minus at plus f of x plus at. But there's another part. Uh, that that um, corresponds to the initial velocity, u sub t. And there's two ways to write this formula. In the first way, I have a definite, in the second, last term, definite integral, 1 over 2a times the integral from x minus at to x plus at of little g of s ds. And in the second way, I've just picked some antiderivative capital G for little g and plugged in the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, so some of your homework problems are related to this, and some of the easier parts is just are just to check that you get the right initial values. We already showed in the last lecture just by using the chain rule, that any, I'll use a fresh letter here, uh, h of x minus at 
or h of x plus a t does satisfy the wave equation. That's uh, pretty straightforward to show. So certainly this formula for u is a solution, either one of the ones above, a solution to the wave equation. And we can check that u of x0 is what it's supposed to be. So u of x0 using Oh, I don't know, either one, let's use the second one, is one half, well, t equals zero, f of x minus a t is just f of x, and at t equals zero, f of x plus a t is just f of x. So that's f of x. And u sub t at x zero, We'll use the chain rule, so I have the one half. I have to take d by dt of f of x minus a t by the chain rule. That's f prime at x minus a t times minus a. And we're going to evaluate that at t equals zero. Plus the second term, d by dt, is f prime at x plus a t times plus a, and we're supposed to evaluate all of this at t equals zero, and we get uh, one half, oh, I forgot the second, <laughs> second term, plus one over two a, g prime at x plus a t. So that will be g prime at x times the derivative of x plus a t, which is a, plus, and then minus g prime at x minus a t times minus a, evaluated at t equals zero, which is g prime at x minus a. Okay, so at t equals zero, uh, we get one half times f uh, minus a f prime of x plus a f prime of x, which is zero, plus one over two a. Uh, then there's an A times capital G prime at X, which is little g of X. And sure enough, that's little g of X. So look at that. We just, there is no stupid Fourier series here. We just wrote down the solution to the initial, uh, initial boundary value problem. Um, for f and g uh, arbitrary differentiable, twice differentiable functions on R. So who cares whether they're odd or even or whatever. We can just write down that solution and that's the answer. So um, if you want to solve the natural initial boundary value problems, then uh, your, your f and your g will be coming from even or odd extensions of initial data on some interval 0L. And once you've got those extensions, you can just plug them in here. You didn't need any Fourier series at all. But actually, Fourier series is the best way sometimes to write down those extensions if you're going to be doing computations. And 
uh, one of the goals today is to connect everything we've been doing with Fourier series to these d'Alembert solutions. So we will do two examples. The first one will be a type 2 uh, free endpoint boundary value problem, initial boundary value problem, using one of our favorite uh, profile functions. And our second example will be a type 1 fixed endpoint problem with uh, an impulse wave. I'll explain what that means. Okay, so let's do the first example. Okay, this is a wave equation, UTT equals 9 UXX. The X's are going from 0 to 2 pi. Let's record also that the speed is 3, because the speed squared is 9, and um, L is 2 pi. 2L, the period is 4 pi, uh, potentially. Okay, and um, in this problem, there is no initial velocity, but we have an initial profile curve, f of x, which is the tent function, which we originally defined uh, to be from minus pi to pi, and then extended as... as 2 pi periodic, but here we're using the part of the tent function that actually looks like a tent between 0 and 2 pi. So L is 2 pi. Our Fourier series will have angular frequencies of um, uh, n times pi over L, which is n over 2, so half integers. And um, the tent function has even integers, I mean has whole integers, but those are a subset of the half integers when your n's are even. And the tent function is the even extension of the profile that we see between 0 and 2 pi. So we already have the Fourier series for f even. Okay, and now that means we can just write down our solution. We just use our building blocks and in infinite superposition. So u of xt, I'm just looking at the Fourier series for our even extension, will be uh, pi over 2. Remember, that's a constant solution to the heat equation. Minus 4 over pi, the sum over n odd, 1 over n squared. Now, I have a bunch of very many product solutions that I'm adding up. The x dependence is cosine of nx. Because I'm doing the initial conditions where I specify the profile and have the initial velocity zero, the I use, I choose to use the cosines of, so they have to be a omega t, a was 3, so 3 n are the time omegas t. Okay, so this was because, so um, u of x0 reproduces the tent function and cosine of 0 is 1 and so that u sub t 
of x0 is 0 because the derivative of cos 3 nt is minus 3 n sine t, which is 0 at t equals 0. So just for review, if I was trying to do the complementary problem, so if instead I wanted uh, u of x0 to be 0 and u sub t of x0 to be 10 to the x, Then, instead of the cosine nx times cosine 3nt, I would have used the sine of 3n, a n, t. That would be 0 when I plugged in t equals 0. And then I want the t derivative to become 1 so that at t equals 0 the u sub t is just reproducing the Fourier series for a tent. So I would have to divide by 3n. Okay, so that's just a bit of review. Anyway, we wrote down the solution. Once you know what to do with the building blocks and if the building blocks are the correct omegas for your Fourier series, then it's as easy as just uh, doing what we did, multiplying the x functions by the right t functions and adding them all up. Okay. Now, I said this lecture was about tying d'Alembert solutions to Fourier series solutions. We know from page 1, since there's no initial velocity, that u of x t alternately should be writable as 1 half of tenth of x minus 3 plus tenth of x plus 3t. Right? That's just what we were doing on page 1 when there was no little g. Okay, so those guys don't look the same, but they really are. So um, let's see why. And it's going to be some of our favorite trig identities, the cosine addition angle formulas. U of xt equals, well, I'll take, I'll split that pi halves and do pi fourths, then minus, oh, actually, let me just rewrite the solution and then explain what I'm doing. So I have cosine nx, cosine 3, N T. We have done this at all kinds of different junctures in this course, turned products of trigs into sums using addition angle. And so here we want to know that oh, different color it. Cosine of A plus or minus B is cos A, cos plus or minus B, which is cos B, and then it's minus or plus sine A, well, it's actually minus sine A, sine of plus or minus B, which is plus or minus sine B, and you minus that, you get the minus or plus sine B. And so there we have a cos nx cosine 3nt. And so using the cosine addition angle formula, um, if I take cos of 
a plus b and add it to cos of a minus b, the sine a sine b terms cancel out, and I just get twice cos a cos b. So in other words, cos a cos b is one-half cos a plus b, so that's cos nx plus 3nt plus cos uh, a minus b, which is cos nx minus 3nt. Okay, and this is really n times x plus 3t and n times x minus 3t. And so now what we can do is rewrite u of xt as I'll split the pi halves in half, pi fourths minus, I've got that one half in the trig identity and the four on the outside, so net, that's a minus two over pi, sum, one over n squared, and I'll take the first sum using cosine of n, times x plus 3t, and then I'll take the other pi over 4 that adds up to pi halves when I double it, minus 2 over pi, and then I'll use the sum of the 1 over n squared cosine of n times x minus 3t. Okay, and notice that if I reverse the order of those two contributions, the second one is exactly one half tent of x minus 3t, and the first one is one-half tent of x plus 3t. So um, the Fourier series solution reproduced the d'Alembert solution. If you're working with technology and don't want to have to define uh, things piecewise, up and down the real axis, then it's actually easier to work with the Fourier series, which are already, already periodic in the x-variable. Okay, so that was one of our, oops, one of our goals. Okay, so I just wrote down the work we just did at the start of 1C, and now we are going to watch a movie that illustrates what we just did. So the, the red curve is u of xt. At t equals zero, it's the tent. This is for uh, t is uh, close to zero, but it's already slightly larger then zero. And uh, um, the red function was the green function plus the purple function. The green function was, uh, it's got x plus three t's in it, so that's a traveling wave going in the negative direction. So the green tents, which are half of the original tent, are traveling in the negative direction, whereas the purple tents, they have x minus 3 t's, they are traveling in the 
positive direction. And then the, uh, the solution to our initial boundary value problem is just the superposition of those two. And so you can see that the vertical coordinates in the red graph are the sum of the vertical coordinates in the green and the blue graph. And it's kind of cool. As, as t increases here, you can see the purple is pulling away from the green. So at a slightly larger time, you'll have a longer interval where their sum is constant. And then similarly also at the minimum, there will be a longer time when the sum is constant. So it's kind of a weird uh, motion to be watching. Uh, someone might complain that these are not actually twice continuously differentiable functions because of those corners. Yeah, that's true. But any truncated Fourier series is totally fine because it's just a sum of uh, differentiable functions. So you can think of this as a limit picture. Okay, so let's go to Desmos. Okay, here we are. Um, I'm just first going to run the solution. You, uh, you could check that the, the red curve is the solution that we um, wrote down for the wave. And you can see that's how this weird wave is oscillating. Okay, now let's turn that guy off and let's watch the, um, the red and the blue, per the, the purple and the green curves which are moving to the left and the right. If I, there we go. So those are our traveling waves. They're always adding up at a zero and two pi so that they're horizontal there, so that they're satisfying the zero flux condition. And now I'll just add in their sum. So this solution to the zero flux uh, boundary condition um, heat equation problem, which is the red curve oscillating up and down between zero and two pi, is the sum of two traveling waves with the same profile, but one of them is moving um, to the left with speed three, and one of them is moving to the right with speed three. Okay, let's go back and look at our second example. And uh, of course, everything is for fun if you just define fun right. But I was fascinated by the example we're about to do. And I saw it in a physics class, which was a prerequisite for quantum mechanics, which was called waves. I'm not sure where that occurs. In our physics department, you probably also would see this in advanced applied math courses. And if this wasn't COVID-19 days and we were still meeting in LCB 219, I would have brought a slinky to the last day of class. I bought a great one online a few years ago. It's made out of steel, none of this stupid plastic. And we would have visualized our theory by shaking the slinky. So one experiment we would have done is uh, two volunteers would have stretched the slinky, the slinky, practically the length of our very wide classroom. And then I would have had them demonstrate the fundamental mode. You remember for the fixed endpoint problem, that's the one that looks like half of a sine curve going up and down. It's the slow mode and uh, for transverse oscillations with fixed endpoints. 
then by pinching the slinky and letting it go, we would have demonstrated compression waves going back and forth between fixed endpoints. So we would have seen both compression waves and transverse waves. And I don't know if you remember the modeling, their speeds are potentially different. But by an accident of slinkiness, uh, for slinkies, the speeds are almost the same. And that's basically because a slinky's tension is roughly proportional to how long it is since its rest uh, configuration, it has essentially zero length. And then when you work out what the speeds are in terms of T naught for the transverse oscillation, which depends on how, how, um, how far apart you've pulled the ends, or if you work out the speed as minus T prime of rho, you get the same uh, as a square root of uh, uh, t, t prime of rho, um, you get the same uh, answer. And so we would have actually gotten our stopwatches out and checked the periods for transverse and compression waves and see that they were almost the same. Plus, what else? What's better than that for the last day of classes? Okay. And then, this is what we're going to model. If you start an impulse down a slinky with people holding either end, so a little bump function, say moving from the left to the right, then when it reflects off the person's, uh, where the person is holding it at the other end, it'll come back upside down. This is kind of cool to see with the slinky. And um, math explains why that happens. And we use our favorite things like superposition. And let me explain how that goes. So um, this is a specific example, but uh, I could have used any sort of uh, impulse profile. So the function we're going to use is defined piecewise on the interval from 0 to pi. And from 0 to pi 8, it's just cosine of 4x. And then from pi 8 to pi, it's 0. And um, we're going to start out with the even extension of that function. And Desmos uh, drew the picture once I computed the Fourier series. This is kind of like one of the nasty homework problems I gave you last week, but I realized this example is better than that one, so um, we're using this profile function, although I had planned to use the one you suffered for. Okay, so there's no way I was going to spend an hour computing the Fourier coefficients by hand, so I used maple. Last time I tried Wolfram Alpha, it seemed kind of gimpy, but it should work as well. Anyway, um, this was an even profile function, and first I was interested in the even, I, I was interested in the even extension. So it has a cosine series. I had to break out the n equals 4 coefficient because n equals 4 doesn't work in that sum because of the denominator of n squared minus 16. And as you noticed when you were doing homework problems, with these piecewise functions, you, you often get cosines at fractions of n pi or sines at fractions of n pi. And um, unless you have to, it's actually just better to leave them in that form rather than try to figure out if they're, what their specific values are depending on whether n is odd, even, a multiple of 4, multiple of 8, whatever. So anyway, this is the Fourier series. Okay, so if we wanted to, uh, so, uh, so here's how we're going to solve um, a particular initial boundary value problem with fixed endpoints. So actually, I'm not going to give you what u of 0 and u sub t of 0 are. 
Rather, what I'm going to do, and this is kind of what happens when you're trying to use d'Alembert solutions to solve the natural initial boundary value problems, you use even extensions and then you might take their opposites and do weird compositions. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take um, f even at x minus 2t. So that's going to the right at speed 2t, at speed 2, my bad. <laughs> the speed is 2. And then I'll take the opposite of f, the same profile, but evaluated at x plus 2t, plus 2t, so that's going to the left. And so that's what's happened here. We've let the clock run um, uh, long enough so that uh, oh, did I do this right? <laughs> I think I did. Uh, I wonder if I yeah, I got the colors reversed. Okay, this is the purple guy, so that's this guy is going to the right, and this is the green guy. It's the opposite sign, and it's going to the left. And remember, these are 2 pi periodic things, so every the whole train is marching in, in sync. Okay, and what you can see is, so this, this green guy originally came from 2 pi. Uh, at the same time, the purple guy was just touching, uh, was at zero. And um, after, let's see, after pi over... 2, the purple guy will have made it to pi going to the right, and the green guy will have made it going to pi at the left, and their exact opposites, no matter where they are, as they cross pi. So their sum will be 0. So this carefully chosen superposition gives us a type 1 solution. And um, the, the u of xt, which I didn't write down, well, it was the f even of x minus 2t minus f even of x plus 2t. So we could actually, uh, you would just substitute in the, those values into this formula. And using the same sort of uh, trickery, um, yeah, or uh, yeah, <laughs> or you could put in the building block um, cosine of um, two n t terms, or cosine uh, yes, cosine of two n t terms. Uh, to, to make the solution. Anyway, then using the addition angle formulas, um, you could rewrite it this way. All right, so you can check all of that. I didn't want to get into the weeds, but I ended up doing it anyways. Instead, let's just go watch the movie at Desmos. That will be the end of this lecture and all the course lectures. And I love this example. It's the best I can do since I don't have an actual slinky and you're not in my actual classroom. And uh, math is fun. I love visualization and understanding 
what the analytic work has to do with the geometry. Uh, and part of the fun is the frustration while you're trying to get everything right. But if you keep working, you sometimes get to experience that eureka moment, or lots of them. Okay, so let's go watch the movie, and then that'll be it. Okay, so um, the purple and the green guy, I'm trying to make this pull out, oops, don't want to do that. Yeah. iPads are a little gimpy with Desmos. Okay, the purple guy uh, is the wave traveling to the right, because you see the X minus two Ts. The green guy is the wave traveling to the left, because you see the X plus four Ts. So I took that Fourier series and I plugged in the X minus two Ts and the X plus two Ts. And then when I added them up and used addition angle formulas, I got the uh, curve label 4, which is not currently running. So uh, I first want to show you the, the bumps moving to the left and the right. And there we go. Okay, so this, this is my wave train. They call them wave trains. Moving to the left and the right. Our solution is going to be the sum of those. So let me turn on the solution. And you can see that part of the time it's the purple guy and part of the time it's the green guy. And when it crosses pi, uh, the superposition gives you zero and, and the profile uh, changes from being <laughs> come on iPad don't make me look bad I'm trying to scooch oh <laughs> I, I ran out of luck you saw how the black curve uh, was uh, above the axis on the way to the right and then it came back below the axis on the way to the left and that's because um, the, when it was going to the right, the sum of the two functions was just the purple guy because there were no green guys. And then when it got to pi, as long as you're between the interval between 0 and pi, the purple guy left and the sum of the two guys was the green guy. Okay, can I? There. Okay. No, no, no. Here we go. Yeah. Okay, so it's currently purple going to the right. Now, the purple's not in the interval between 0 to pi, but the green is. So it's the green going to the left. And now it reflects up. Okay, so it's just this uh, superposition. And it explains this uh, reflection behavior, which I always found as being super cool and which is fun to watch with a slinky. Okay, I've said enough. We are done. I hope you enjoyed this. See you later.